Good morning, and thank you for joining us here today. I am Felicia Cito Lau. I'm Parent Involvement Advisory Committee member for Ward 3 and co lead of the Ready, Set, Engage Working Group for 2020. The purpose of PIAC is to support, encourage, and enhance parent engagement at the board level in order to improve student achievement and well being. And that's from Ontario Regulation 330 10, Section 6. And I am Nadia Dunod, PIAC representative for Ward 22 and the other co-lead of the organizing group for bringing our 14th year of the Parent Involvement Conference. I'd like to invite our PIAC co-chairs, Dee Williams and Zina Sharek, to welcome you. Thank you, Nadia. Hello, everyone. I'm Dee Williams, PIAC co-chair, and I welcome everyone here today. I want to take a moment to thank everyone who's been involved in the planning and development of this conference. This was a huge undertaking to pivot from in-person uh, conference to virtual. So I'd like to acknowledge the volunteer work and support of the PIAC Ready, Set, Engage working group uh, and all the working group members and the Parent and Community Engagement Office. Also, I would like to thank the workshop uh, presenters for providing their valuable time, energy, and knowledge this weekend as volunteers. Thank you, everyone who's joining us uh, for your hard work, dedication, and commitment to parent engagement. These workshop topics are were brought forth by PIAC members after listening to our parent communities. And we have assembled these workshops to help participants support their children's uh, education journey. We hope you will find it informative and helpful. Hi, I'm Zina Sherrick, the other PIAC co-chair. This year, we are not gathered together at Earl Haig Secondary School, but we're online. We will not see everyone's faces gathered together in the cafeteria like we have in the past, but we have organized networking sessions for the end of the day tomorrow. Please join us at 2.45 tomorrow for closing notes of appreciation along with networking breakout rooms. Trustees, superintendents, and PIAC members will be there to meet and greet you. The conference hashtag is hashtag PIAC Ready, Set, Engage. So that's hashtag P-I-A-C, ready, set, engage. So please ensure that you share your thoughts using the hashtag throughout this weekend. Now I'd like to welcome Elder Joanne Delaire to offer greetings to open up the day and share how we could respect the treaties in our day-to-day -day lives. Good morning. Unfortunately, it looks like uh, Dr. Delaire um, is... Uh not able to join us at this time. So um, I'd actually like to provide a land acknowledgement um, instead uh, at this time until, uh, until we can have Elder Delaire join us. Um, I, we acknowledge we are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis and the Inuit peoples. At this time, um, we also are missing, unfortunately, Trustee Brown, who's the chair of the board to speak. Um, so I would actually like to um, move on actually and see if we could ask, um, welcome Karen Faulkner, Interim Associate Director of Equity, Wellbeing and School Improvement to speak. Thank you. Thank you, and I acknowledge um, the partners I work with here on this screen, and in particular, uh, Trustee Trixie Doyle, who is our trustee, our incoming trustee to work with PIAC. So perhaps given uh, the, um, the delay from Chair Brown, uh, Trustee Doyle would be best able to begin um, our speaking. So Trustee Doyle. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, 
on behalf of the board, I want to thank uh, PIAC for putting on this event. This is our 14th year doing this. Um, in the past, I've had the pleasure of trying to run it, but I've never had to do that in a virtual format. So thank you for taking on this really difficult and, and new task. Uh, we've had wonderful feedback on this event in past years, and um, I'm really glad to see it happening again. Thank you also to Michelle Monroe and Latha and Margaret from the Parent and Community Engagement Office for all their hard work behind the scenes mm -hmm. on the event. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day, and I will see you in some of the workshops. Thank you, Trustee Doyle. On behalf of Director uh, Kathy Withrow, my colleague, uh, Associate Directors, Andrew Gold, Craig Snyder, and also on behalf of the entire senior team and leadership in the school board, we are so gratified that parent engagement has actually been amplified and increased because of the virtual settings. Countless numbers of school councils have been reporting exceptional attendance through virtual um, mediums, particularly Zoom, since that's what the board uses. And we are so proud that instead of minimizing voice during this very critical time of the pandemic, we are actually bringing more people to the fore. And while it might, might not be in the way that I like best, which is in person, it is in fact more accessible for so many in our communities who have so many competing demands while they wish to be engaged in schools and in education, particularly in public education. And so we have to ask our question, ourselves the question, just as our students do, how exactly are we to deliver public education going forward? Many of our families have decided to go virtual, not only because of the pandemic, but because in fact, that is a more accessible medium for delivering public education for many families, given the structures and given the um, life circumstances of those families. And we have to ask ourselves, well, should we not have considered this some time ago? We should have maybe had the capability to deliver in person and virtual so that we actually welcomed all families to come in at the levels at which they wanted to. I think that this pandemic will serve to make us stronger, better, and more able to deal with the diversity of students and families we are supposed to reach. So while I bemoan personally and professionally the circumstances of this pandemic, and particularly here in Toronto, the increased um, restrictions that we all will be under, I am so gratified that schools are remaining open. I am so gratified that we offer both, both virtual and in-person learning. Our job is to serve, our commitment is to serve, and this weekend section sessions will serve to highlight that message from all of us to the people who have organized this and spent countless hours doing that, not just this year, but over the last 14 years. I congratulate all of you on behalf of all of our leadership for making it so adaptable to the current circumstances. We grow better, not because we necessarily wanted to do it this way, but we found the best to come out of this. Thank you to all. Thank you, Associate Director Falconer. Those are well said words and thank you for joining us this morning. I'd actually like to welcome Trustee Doyle Trustee Trixie Doyle from Ward 14. We're very fortunate at PIAC to have Trustee Doyle as the trustee representative for PIAC this year. Um, as she mentioned, she was a past PIAC member and uh, organizer of events and, like this. And uh, we're just so thrilled to have you back uh, representing uh, the board on PIAC this year. She will, um, she will introduce our keynote speaker for today. Thank you. Thank you, Felicia. I'm really glad to be back um, with PIAC. Can't stay away for long. So I now have the pleasure to introduce our first inspirational keynote from Michelle Monroe. 
Central Coordinator of the Parent and Community Engagement Office. Michelle Monroe champions anti-oppressive and anti-biased parent caregiver engagement and community development. She, she is a social work practitioner and the manager of parent and community engagement with the Toronto District School Board. As a trained facilitator and public speaker, Michelle has worked in the five, sorry, in the field of public education and public service for over 20 years, delivering anti-oppressive, anti-bias, and anti-Black family community development workshops and presentations. I met Michelle years ago when I first joined PIAC, and since then I've learned so much from her and witnessed her champion family engagement in our board. I've watched her speak to parents with passion and humor, giving parents and caregivers the encouragement, support, and information they need to best support their school councils and their children. So please help me welcome this morning, our keynote, Michelle Monroe. Good morning, everybody. It is such a pleasure and such a, such a joy to be with you. Do you know, it's usually I was reflecting prior to joining the conversation that my role within this event for the last, I'm just gonna say number of years, has been to connect with you once we gather into that ballroom for those who've attended the PIAC event each year and just give you an update as to what's been happening uh, with school counseling engagement across our district. So this opportunity to do this again is really my pleasure, but I wanna first extend my thanks and my appreciation to the Parent Involvement Advisory Committee who are the backbone of the work that you see happening in so many places um, in engagement across our district. And I dare say that they're all volunteers. And I wanna extend my thanks and my appreciation that through this time, this committee has continued to do this outstanding work. And I wanna echo Associate Director Faulkner when she says, our school council members, our leaders, our parent caregivers, guardians, you have just been doing outstanding things over the last nine months. So I wanna extend my thanks and appreciation to you for being there. So I am one who's getting very comfortable with this online thing. And so I wanna hear from you. I wanna see you in the chat. Tell me how you're doing. Tell me how you're feeling right now. Uh, tell me what this great morning has brought you. Tell me what you've been feeling in the last couple of days. Let's get connected. So I want you to tell me in the chat how you're doing while I share my screen to get prepared to get started. So let, let me see who's talking to me in the chat. I want to know what you're thinking, what you're feeling. Thank you so much for that. Thank you very much for that. So I'm so pleased and very glad. I noticed we have others who are continuing to join us and coming through throughout the day. And I'm hoping that this number will continue and parent and caregivers will continue to join us throughout the day. So I've been thinking about my conversation with you this morning and thinking, I don't think I can begin a conversation without reflecting on where we're at. So there is no doubt that we're in unusual times. There's no doubt that COVID-19 over the last few months has really impacted the way in which we think and move. There is no doubt that it has impact on our employment lives, has impact on our income lives, just overall financially, we have somehow uh, been impacted. There's no doubt that the Black Lives Matter movement has had a significant impact throughout the globe, whether it be personally or individually or from an institutional perspective. So the question becomes, what do we do when we're in unusual times? How do we respond to these unusual times? And I've been doing some reflection and thinking about that. And so here is a quote that comes to my mind when I think about unusual times, but not just unusual times, but also my times when I'm feeling in particular places, maybe down flustered, there's a mentor that I turn to. Her name is Ayanna Van Zandt. And there isn't a quote that Ms. Van Zandt does not have for all situations. And the one I'm sharing with you today that's gonna frame my conversation with you is, in any situation, you have the right, power, and ability 
to not only choose your experience, but also decide whether you're going to be a voice or an echo. I'm gonna let that one sit for a moment, that in any situation we have the right and we have the ability to not only choose our experience, but we get the opportunity to decide whether we're going to be a voice or an echo. So what does that mean during this time? It started me thinking about critical questions. And these critical questions aren't mine. These critical questions are from an article I was reading that was shared with me and some staff by Dr. Vidya Shah. And Dr. Shah poses these critical questions for a critical moment in this way. So here's the first question. How might this time of uncertainty and reckoning influence who we choose to be and how we choose to live? The second one, how will it influence the how and why of schooling in ways that will both be challenging and perpetuate historical barriers to educational access and opportunity. And the last one, how might we seize this opportunity to resist traditional educational discourses, legitimize marginalized knowledge and imagine future possibilities? So it's this critical questions, these three critical questions that I've been pondering from a personal and professional lens and one that I'm gonna speak with you today. And so my question be becomes, what needs to happen in parent caregiver guardian engagement if we were to seize this opportunity to resist traditional education discourse legitimize marginalized, marginalized knowledge and imagine future possibilities. And the first thing that came to my mind was, there's gotta be some disruption ahead. That in order to do this, to seize this opportunity, we've gotta be willing to think about how are we going to disrupt some of the practices and behaviors and some of the ideology that we have made normalized. So what does disrupting traditional understanding and practice of parent guardian engage engagement look like? So here's the first thing that came to my mind. We need to acknowledge that engagement has been framed from a very whiteness perspective. So what I really mean by that is in not all of our spaces have we been inclusive. There are many spaces where we've just in excluded, maybe not intentionally, but the impact has been we've excluded experiences of racialized and indigenous identities. Meaning that parent caregivers, guardians who are racialized, their identities are not fully represented in our spaces in education, whether that be classroom, whether that be school council, right? Whether that be in our programs and our activities, and so one of the things as the world begins to open up and has opened up and we've all been paying attention to, one of the things we've realized is that these identities have not been normalized. They've been on the periphery. And while many of us have done work to try to bring them to the center, it remains on the periphery. So as we look at this moment and begin to maximize this opportunity we have, one of the things we truly need to be giving thought to, how are we doing this? How are we acknowledging that there are voices that have not been in our space? How are we acknowledging that there are perspectives that have been missing and that there's work that needs to be done to shift and change that? The second thing for me is, how do we debunk this myth, right? That the boards of education or schools are neutral spaces, that they're race neutral spaces. Many of us believe that they're race neutral spaces, but the reality is that they're not. Many spaces are inequitable. Many parent caregivers, guardians continue to ex express inequitable treatment in spaces as they move throughout education. And that many students also speak of harmful 
right, experiences, particularly racialized and indigenous students, and particularly racialized indigenous parents and guardians. And we also hear a lot from our, our parents with children with exceptionality, special education. We hear them say their voices are already present. And we hear them say sometimes they're on the margin, right? We hear similar things from our LGBTQ plus parents, caregivers, and the guardians. So now we're at this pivotal point of how are we disrupting, right? How can we disrupt this place and time and our way of being? The other area is we need to name that racialized, particularly black and indigenous caregivers are blamed and shamed a lot for academic disparities. There's enough research that's done, whether it's the one that my, the Parent and Community Engagement Office sort of facilitated about two years ago, whether it's research that's coming out of American global spaces that are telling us racialized families are feeling that they're blamed, that if students aren't doing well, that if they're not meeting academic milestones, whatever that may look like for that particular students, that these parents are being held accountable. That the focus is not where it should be. The focus is rarely on the fact that there are deficits in our system that are creating these inequities and these, and these curriculum and academic disparities. The focus becomes the parents. But there's also the reality that we must name that their cultural and social capital are received as a deficit and that racialized and indigenous parents are labeled with the hard to reach syndrome. And if we think about the hard to reach syndrome, I've named it the hard to reach syndrome. That's my label. Because those who have heard me talk, you've heard me say we use it a lot. And when we use this long, this language, they are hard to reach. Let's think about it. Who are the they first? And secondly, are they hard to reach? So to disrupt traditional understanding and practice of parent caregiver engagement, we're going to have to acknowledge that engagement has been framed. We're going to have to demonk the myths that boards and educations and our schools and our playgrounds are race neutral spaces because they're not. And we're going to have to name that racialized, particularly black and indigenous caregivers have been blamed and shamed for a very long time and their social capital has not been valid and that they've been deemed as deficit and that they've been labeled the hard to reach. So another one of our traditional practices that we need to disrupt is this idea of our emphasis on our focus on responsibility. We spend a lot of time. Now I'm not suggesting that responsibility, parent caregiver and guardian responsibility in education is not important, but boy, do we spend a lot of time talking about it. And most parents, caregivers are aware of the responsibility, but as a district, and I don't think it's just as a district, I also think in the field of education, we spend a lot of time on this, telling parents what their responsibilities are, right? And we highlight it that, you know, it's important that you get your kids on into school. We important that we get them there on time. It's important that you remain engaged, right? It's important that you get a sense and an understanding. And we continue to do this in many, many ways, which would lead to suggest that most parents and caregivers are not aware of that responsibility. The other thing I want to disrupt is our emphasis on the knowledge of how the system works. Now, I'm not suggesting that parent and caregivers shouldn't understand how to navigate our education system, because there's some parent and caregivers who do, but there's a lot of energy that's spent on doing this. And I'm wondering if we need to rethink the ways in which we get to this system knowledge and navigating the education system. Is there another way to be doing this, this work and sending this message without this overemphasis on navigating the education system? Another practice to disrupt, the idea that parent and caregiver engagement belongs to the school. And that parent engagement is school centric because we spend a lot of time trying to design engagement that it becomes school centric. And that the school determines the what and the where and the how engagement happens. And right now, if we're to name it and be honest, we can actually say that in some cases that is the case. The school is very centric to engagement. 
The school defines when, how, where, and even if engagement happens. And if there's anything this time has taught us, this COVID period, if there's any opportunities that we are maximizing, it's that this narrative of school-centric engagement or ownership of engagement by schools and boards, that that needs to be shifted because what we're seeing happening across, not just our district and not just across our province and not just across our country, but across the globe, is that that is shifting. That engagement is really not being directed by the school right now. It's actually happening from family caregiver, caregiver's home, kitchens, dining rooms, living room, wherever it's taking place. So this is one of this traditional practice and knowing that we need to disrupt and disrupt it in a way that we're really thinking about, not just from an activity project based, but from an actually designed space, what engagement looks and fits and who are the stakeholders and partners engagement and how we do that, right? Because we have set design things in education where we say, these are the entry points for parents. So at the beginning of the year, here are the curriculum nights for parents, caregiver guardians. This is the place of your engagement. We have school council, parent caregivers. This is the place of your engagement. And this is the time we like it to happen. During parent student teacher conferences, this is the place and this is the right place for it to happen. So from a systemic perspective, we clearly have outlined, these are the places and the times when parent caregivers are welcomed. COVID has flipped that around, hasn't it? And in places where we thought we could not and that we deemed impossible at one point has now become the possible of the ways in which we engage. And I'll become speaking to that a little more later on. The other thing for me that I like to see us disrupt is this ownership of classrooms. There's this sustained belief that parents and caregivers are visitors to the school, classroom, and, edu and, and education. And throughout our practices and spaces and places, we know this to be true. It is a difficult truth to acknowledge, but we know it to be truth, that they are visitors. They're invited in particular places, and if they come uninvited, it creates a discomfort, right? And there's this belief that education is designed for school and staff. And the reality is if we look deep into the structures of education and how it's designed, it is truly designed for staff and students. And it sometimes feel that this archaic design is now clashing with the reality of what is. And the reality of what is and what has been for a very long time is that parent caregivers and guardians, students and staff are partners in education, but it's difficult to partner when the archaic design remains intact. And I'm gonna flag a couple of those because I've been giving some thought to it for, for a long time. And as a district, you may not see it as parent and caregivers, but behind the scenes, we're working to address that archaic design. So one of the most visible ones for me that has been is we have structures, tools and mediums for students and teachers to talk. Here we are in a new decade where we're still trying to fine tune tools where we can have parents, caregivers and students talk or where we can have parent caregivers and guardians talking directly to educators, whether that be the teacher in the classroom, the principal, the superintendent, the executive superintendent. We are just at the cusp of figuring out how are districts designed so that all those three core partners can partners. For a very long time, we've been talking about the tripod of education, that the three core partners are students, parents, parents, caregivers, guardians, right? And, and But yet, we still don't have an infrastructure to make that happen. And I know in our district, we're working behind the scenes, and I know parents and caregivers, you may not always see it in the front, but we're working to try to find a way to close that. Right, and to find and redesign not just programs and activities, but our infrastructure to be sure that we can make this happen in places where parent, caregivers, students, and staff have a platform to be able to connect and communicate in a way that's easy for our teachers, 
that is not four or five different platforms, that's easy for parent caregivers, that we're all in one place and accessible to each other, but that also links our leadership, whether that be the principal or the superintendent into dialogues in one quick way, right? And so this is when I, this is what I mean when I talk of an archaic structural design for education that was only done for two of the stakeholders and where that practice is now needing to be disrupted in an intentional way so we can shift that. The other one that we've been working on that requires even more disruption is the idea of experts. That the only experts in education are principals and educators, right? And experts in all things, right? And we've been on this journey of speaking of who are experts in what. We speak a lot about different types of expertise. So we know that our educators, our teachers, they have been trained in curriculum. They have been trained in assessment and evaluation. And so there's an expectation I think we all have, whether it be in the district or as parent caregivers and guardians, that our parent, that our staff are bringing that expertise to the table and they're bringing it to the classroom. But when it comes to areas of community engagement and development and parent caregiver engagement and parent partnerships, that there are other experts. When it comes to students and children, that there are other experts. And how are we leveling that playing field so parent caregivers and guardians become real experts? We give it lip service, we speak to it a lot, we do. But usually in daily practice, what we find is parents and caregivers are the afterthought, right? and they are not treated as equitable partners in the dialogue. Now, I didn't say equal partners. I said equitable partners in the dialogue. And they're equitable partners in the dialogue because parent caregivers and guardians bring valuable knowledge, social capital, right, to that child and to the education system and to that teacher. And so we've got to learn how we're gonna value the varying expertise that comes into our classrooms, our schools, or our district. And, and disrupting the idea of one expert is really our ongoing work. And that there's multiple experts that bring those varying experience and we need to value that. The other thing is the social capital of parents, caregivers that are not reflected. One of the things that I'm constantly doing when I'm working with educators is having this, this conversation about who owns spaces, that classrooms are not spaces of the educator. And that classrooms are spaces that represent and reflect our students. But I dare say that classrooms are spaces that represents our family, parents, and caregivers. And that's because our students are coming from something in somewhere. And when those classrooms can acknowledge those places of where they're coming from, it validates the student and it validates that space and it creates a more welcoming space for them. And what that means is we're beginning to think about the social capital and the knowledge that parent caregivers and guardians bring to education and begin to incorporate them in meaningful ways in our classroom space. But also as we move throughout our schools. And it's funny because as we are now becoming virtual, we're all thinking of ways in which that our backdrops, right? Uh, that our classrooms, uh, when teachers are creating classrooms, that they're trying to find spaces that are representative and reflective of not just themselves, but presents and portrays themselves well. So while COVID has shifted our lives in ways that we could not have imagined nine months ago, I truly believe that it has opened up the space for us um, in terms of possibilities particularly in this area of parent and community caregiver engagement. So now I start thinking about the what if. What if we use this time where we are being asked to spend more time at home, we're being asked to spend more time indoors, we're spending far more time with children that, let's be honest, that we some value in moments and not in others. What if we were using this time to do some self-reflection and inquiry? And
And what if we were using this time and finding some silence within the noise? Which leads me to another one of my favorite quotes that says, go placidly amid the noise and the haste and remember what peace there may be in silence. So I know some of you are sitting there listening to me and say, Michelle, silence, have you been to my house? Silence, silence at this particular point, right? But you know, the silence that I'm speaking of is not always necessarily finding a place where there is no noise. The silence I'm speaking of, a while finding a place where there is no noise can help a reflection process, it's not a requirement because the silence I'm speaking of is our thoughts about the inside and out approach. One that leads us individually, systemically and collectively to start thinking about improvements. Improvements, particularly in terms of our principles and our practices in this work of engagement. Ways in which we engage, how we engage, whom are we engaging, right? A reflection on some of our practices how have I been engaging? You know, I listened to a moving talk yesterday, again, by Dr. Shaw, who was presenting to a group of our staff. And she posed this challenging question to us in our inquiry. She said, when you're sitting in your reflection in an inquiry, I want you to answer this question. In the work that you've been leading in your volunteer spaces, have you been intentionally engaging in non-racist engagement. Because if you've not been intentionally engaging in non-racist parent caregiver engagement, it means that you have been supporting the status quo, which means that you have been engaging in racist engagement. Have you been challenging colonization? She asked us. Think and reflect back on everything that you have done and she said, I'm not sending you back years. I'm just going to send you back in the last year. In everything you have done, think back and reflect. Have you engaged in decolonizing work? Because if you have not, you're upholding the status quo. And the status quo truly has been that we have not been engaging in ways that have provided spaces for everyone that we have not been advocating and supporting for everyone. And that while it was our practice and we normalized that practice, doesn't mean that it was the right practice. And so in this inside approach of reflection, which begins with us beginning first within ourselves, doing our own little individual self-reflection and inquiry, right? We need to be thinking about that and thinking about my own paradigm. What do I believe? How do I see the world? How do I experience the world? Because the way in which I see and experience the world is going to truly dictate the way I engage others in the spaces that I'm in into my world. Or the way I demand that they be in my world or see things from my world and only my world. So if we take some moments and time to do this type of reflection and inquiry, it can really begin us on a journey to begin to say, okay, this is where I am on this. This is how I feel. This is what I believe about this. And because I hold this belief and mindset, my practices have reflected that belief and mindset. And then I need to begin to think about how as an individual, me, the parent caregiver, how have I engaged? Have I engaged in a way that's been open and receptive? Have I been welcoming? As a parent giver, have I been feeling just so exhausted and so tired because it feels like I've been banging my head against a wall to get things to move? So because my head has become so sensitized from all that banging and I now have a massive headache, I have stepped away. And now that I stepped away, has there been impact and implications for that? If I've been that educator in the classroom where my intention was to share a particular content about a particular issue, the intent was not to harm, right? But the impact was harm. How are we reflecting on that to say, why did I believe what was my intention and where, where did that intention come from? 
every parent. If I'm that working committee of the school council who has organized a fundraising event that only targeted a very small group of people and it resulted in some parent caregivers saying to me, you know what? I couldn't have attended that because it was against my beliefs or my practice or my faith. How do we reflect on that? And, but how do we go deeper within ourselves to begin to say, hmm, there is something about who I am in terms of how I identify that looks and feels differently than someone else. And I've got to remember that I take me into every space that I enter. And therefore, if I take me into every space that I enter, I've always got to be cognizant that that's just me. I've got to always be aware that there may be three, four, five, 10, 15, 50 other individuals who are entering into that space with me. And I've got to learn how to be able to open myself up to make sure that it's not just my identity or my place dominating that room. And so this period, I think, gives us the opportunity to do this kind of self-reflection and this time of inquiry. The other piece is about this work around paradigm shift. You know, paradigm is a big work that just simply means the way in which we see the world, right? And this period offers us the opportunity to reflect how we see the world. Because I'm a believer that how we see the world impact the way in which we engage or disengage. And we've heard very clearly that from a district's perspective, we have had to shift some of our paradigms. And I dare say we've heard very clearly from parent caregivers that the way in which we engage parents need to be shifted. And what I take a look at a lot of, because I used to do a lot of reading in Stephen Covey's work, he speaks of habits that we've developed, right? And habits that we've got to undo, right? And then habits, the new habits that we've got to create. And in this piece of engagement, we have developed some habits that we need to do away with that has resulted in sustained practices that now do harm. And so the question I put out to you and I pose is, which of those habits have you developed in engagement that you need to shift? And which of those habits came from what ways in which you see the world? And how and what plan can you put in place to now intentionally say, you know what? This is the habit that I've developed. This is the root of that habit. And I wanna figure out how I can begin to put in place little steps. Because paradigm shift is not just about the district. It's not just about principal. It's not just about teachers. It's also about every parent, caregiver, guardian across our district. Because the way in which we enter a school, the way in which we parent is about a paradigm shift. The way in which we communicate is about a paradigm. I'm sorry. It's about a paradigm. It's about the way in which we live experience. It's about a history that we have. It's about our cultures that we've come from, right? All those experiences have created our paradigm. And some of that paradigm, the way in which we see the world, we need to shift. So I say to every parent caregiver listening, is there something that you need to shift in terms of the way in which you engage? Is there a habit that you have developed that we're at the point and we've been given the opportunity to now rethink? And if so, how can that habit be shifted? Because in this period, we're called upon. I'm not even saying called upon. It's now being demanded that each of us play an active role in this shift. So what if we also, during this disrupting period, begin to use this time to develop a genuine interest in learning and understanding the racialized experience. There's so many opportunities for us to do that. And you know, while I'm an adult, on, on, on some days, let's be honest, uh, my children will tell you, mommy, you're a really big kid. Children's resources are great places for us. And now there's so many resources out there for us to take the opportunity 
to develop a genuine interest in other people's lives. Because developing this interest in other people's lives will open us up. And if it opens us up, it means that it's going to begin to question the way in which we live our lives, the way in which we experience our lives. And once as the adults, the parent caregivers in our children's lives, when we do that, it's amazing how we start doing it for our children. And if we're doing that for us, when we begin to enter spaces with others, it begins to show that we've expressed a genuine interest in learning and understanding the racialized experience. You don't have to do a lot to do that. We now have virtual resources. You can Google it, right? These are some of the ones that I love and I appreciate that are there. Um, it can be shared with your children, but it could just be you because, you know, many of us will say, Michelle, but I'm not comfortable in having this racialized conversation. I do a lot of talks. Many of you may have attended where I say I'm on a mission in this district to have parent caregivers start talking race in their homes. I didn't say start talking racism. I'm on a mission to having parent caregivers start talking race, race with each other as the the adults race within our children, because the data is telling us, the research is telling us unresoundedly that it's not happening. And the fact that it's not happening, our children as early ages as three months are developing racist ideas and thoughts. And because adults are not having the conversation, we don't put ourselves in the position to disrupt it. And so if we're not disrupting it before, they hit middle school. By the time our children are in middle school, they're now outrightly exercising racist activities and racist ideas and racist beliefs and now engaging in racism. So I'm on a mission to say to every parent caregiver across our district, we need to start talking race in our homes. It needs to become a conversation at our dining table. It needs to become one of those casual conversations that we have to begin to remove the fear about talking about race. And now remember, I'm not even talking about racism. I am just talking about race. So we're teaching our children that race is a conversation that we should be having. So disrupting traditional engagement means that we're willing to engage in other people's lives. We're willing to put ourselves out to learn. We've heard about this black, the Black Lives Matter. You've watched it on TV. You turn on your radio. Now the ask is you go a little deeper. And that little deeper means that you begin to express a genuine interest in what that means because we want not only people of African descent and indigenous people talking about this, we want white families talking about this, we want South Asian families talking about this, we want Southeast Asian families talking about it because we're all impacted by it. And when we do that with our children and ourselves, when we come to spaces to engage each other, whether it be in the school council, right? Whether it be in an online meeting, whether it be on the playground, we have a more aware, enhanced understanding of each other and ourselves, which enable us to recognize that I don't need to silence someone else for me to be heard. I don't need to maintain all the power because it needs to be shared. But also I recognize that there are places in my identity that grants me power. And when I recognize that it grants me power, it gives me the opportunity to do something different. So taking the, this time to generate, these are great resources, they're not all. If you go to our website, the Toronto District School Board website, staff have created just some incredible other resources for those who are interested in extending um, their knowledge and just genuine interest in learning and understanding about the racialized and lived experiences. So the other disruption for me is for us to begin to put those voices that have been on the periphery, those parent caregivers who have been on the outside. What if we now make a commitment and intention to put them in the middle? What if our commitment now is we know that racialized newcomer indigenous parent caregivers have been on the periphery, 
Their voices, their experience, their capital has never been at our center. So let's begin to put them at the center. That could be an intentional act. That could be an intentional decision we make, right? As this young student said, and this was her poster at a march, we said Black Lives Matter, never said only Black Lives Matter. We know all Black Lives Matter. We just need your help with Black Lives Matter for Black Lives are in danger. When I saw this clip, it, it just moved me beyond and it just spoke volumes. Volumes that say to us, there are voices that have been on the periphery that we now need to bring to the center. Our students are demanding it and as parents and caregivers and educators, it's now required. So let's begin to bring our racialized families and voices to the center of our school councils. Let's begin to bring them to the center of our curriculum. Let's begin to bring them to the center of our school halls. Let's begin to bring them to the center of our dialogues and our conversations and our planning. Our indigenous community continues to speak to us about decolonizing education, right? And that reconciliation requires the decolonization of it. So if education is decolonized, it means parents, caregivers, elders in our indigenous communities have been on the periphery and we need to move them to the center. Our LGBTQ plus community has been saying the same. Our special education parent caregivers, when I get the opportunity, I hear, I hear from parent caregivers in our congregated sites, their experience of feeling disconnected and isolated, right? And how, as we move through this great time of opportunity, do we begin to bring them, their voices and their lived experiences to everything we do? Because this is the call for us. This is the opportunity that COVID has granted us, right? While it has given us other things, it has given us such incredible possibilities engagement that I'm truly excited about and actually be feeling very proud of being a part of this opportunity and this time to be able to do this. The other disruptional is our understanding and definition of traditional parent engagement. And what we really need to do is to begin to think about how have we defined engagement, right? And we need to be great thinking it about a partnership. We say this a lot, but how do we really make it a partnership and shared leadership? Because we need to define it in this way. We need to define it in a way that it's linked. It's no longer about having nice conversations. It's about connecting parents, caregivers to curriculum and understanding what is happening. It's about affirming and strengthening our families' culture, their race, their linguistic multi-linguistic abilities, their faith. It's really about those key things. It's also about providing parents what they need to be able to have children. And it's also about reinforcing learning in the places where children learn. When I do a lot of work with educators, I talk a lot about our perception of where learning happens and how we think about it. And one of the encouragement I say to teachers all the time is one of the greatest benefits in engaging parent and caregivers and guardians is that it moves learning beyond the classroom. It provides our educators an opportunity to test learning. Anyone who hears me talk, I love her. She's been retired from the board for a very long time. Annie, Annie was a superintendent within the district and one of, she doesn't know it, but she was one of the superintendents who I respect wholeheartedly. And I remember my first time in the district being a part of one of her professional development. And what she basically said was, there are a lot of educators who do a lot of teaching. But unfortunately, there are very few students in their, in their classroom doing learning. That was, at the time for me, it rocked me. Because it was an aha moment that says we need to pay attention, not just to what we're delivering, but whether what is being delivered is being received. And what I say to educators is you have such a great assets of parent caregivers and guardians where you can have children test that learning. But if you don't have the connection or if you're not even open to the possibility that your learning needs to be tested or can be tested in homes, then what begins to happen is there's this barrier that prevents it. 
So one of the disrupting traditional engagement is looking at how we redefine engagement across our district and a way of beginning to look at it that it really meaningfully values parent caregivers and guardians. The other area for me now is looking at what types of engagement make a difference. We do a lot of things when we say we're engaging. I talk a lot about parent engagement versus parent contact. Significant percentage of what we do in education is about contact, it's not about engagement. And I make the distinction because contact usually is when a teacher will make a call because something is happening and they need it, not engagement. Teacher in kindergarten, maybe K to three, uh, will now see a parent on the school ground and say, hey, how are you? Just wanted you to know. Not engagement, contact. Curriculum night, contact. Parent-teacher conference, contact. We do a lot of contact in education, in, 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 in education when it comes to engagement. Engagement means that we're looking at what makes a difference. Engagement means that we're actually now beginning to take that contact opportunity of, oh, I met Mrs. Mohammed on the playground and I introduced myself and I said, hello. And I told her that, 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 that her son was doing well. But after I did that, I then followed up with Mrs. Mohammed in a conversation to say, you know, Mrs. Mohammed, I'd love the opportunity to begin to have a dialogue and conversation with you about how Mohammed is doing in class. Because I'd love to hear from you what you're seeing at home. I'd love to share with you what's happening in the classroom so we can begin to collectively work together to begin to figure out how we can begin to set some collective goals, set some collective standards for Mohammed for your child. That's what engagement looks like. Engagement looks like taking that initial contact and making it far more meaningful. But the engagement that makes a, a difference must be connected that way. So you're not hearing Michelle Monroe say, oh, don't stop the contact. The contact is important. The contact gives us that first step to move into engagement. So let us continue the contact. Disrupting that traditional engagement practice now just means we're now going to go deeper. We're going to move from that contact and we're now going to move to a place of having meaningful conversations between the home and the classroom about that one student and that child that we share in common. Engagement that makes a different nurtures and builds authentic relationships not just with the teacher, but with parent caregivers as well. It's linked to student learning and achievement, and it creates an educational oriented ambiance that creates a sense of support and standards. I highlight that standards because one of this traditional engagement that we need to do away with is that there's some that believe that either parents set too high standards for their children or parents don't set no standards for their children, which suggests that only educators can set standards for children. So the fact that that traditional engagement idea exists tells me that there's a disconnection between the classroom and the home and that we need to continue to do this work to close that because we know what a parent does or does not and a caregiver does or does or not, what an educator does or does not can actually make an actual difference. So this idea, can I disrupt this idea that we have an, an engagement gap? We do not have an education gap. We have a relationship gap. I'm gonna say that again. We do not have a pair, giver, caring, guardian engagement gap. We have a relationship gap. COVID has exposed that to us in ways that we can't even imagine. The fact that we have schools that can't connect with parent caregivers, we, the fact that we have parent caregivers who can't contact an educator or, or an administrator, the fact that it took us this, this long to be able to connect tells us that we don't have an engagement gap, we have a relationship gap. which reminded me of this incredible quote by Maya, another woman who governs most of my life. I have learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. 
but people will never forget how you made them feel. So imagine engagement across our district in every school, whether virtual or bricks or mortar, that makes a parent caregiver feel so good that we don't have to ask questions or create an idea of we have an engagement gap. Because when people feel welcomed and valued, when they feel that who I am is acknowledged and recognized and celebrated, they will engage. This idea that we have an engagement gap is one that we've created and we're sustaining it for various reasons, which I don't have time to get into now. But let us begin to use this language and this narrative that we do not have an engagement gap, we have a relationship gap. So therefore what we're figuring out, what we need to do in this moment, in this opportunity is how are we building relationships? How are we building relationships from caregiver to caregiver? How are we building relationships for guardian and school and teachers and principals and superintendents? How are we building relationships? as we move forward, because COVID has provided us with the opportunity to actually do that. So let's spend also some time, not just talking about families' responsibilities, but now we need to start talking about family rights because there are too many parent caregivers, guardians across education who don't know what their rights are, who absolutely fundamentally don't even know that they have rights. And so one of those things during this period we need to ramp up the conversations we have with family caregivers about their rights, whether it be just human rights, period, but whether it be about the rights that are embedded in the Education Act for parent caregivers in all various sections of our act, we need to start talking to parent caregivers about that so they become fully aware of those rights, right? Because as I sit before you, there's some parent caregivers who actually believe that they don't have the right to advocate that they don't have the right to go in their district or their schools and advocate for the best interest of their children, right? And so we need to start letting parent caregivers and guardian know you have that right and start educating them around those rights. And once we do that, then we begin to help them navigate because knowing your rights will enable to know where and what I can navigate for at what particular point in time. So disrupting traditional engagement also now means opening up. We've heard it, 67,000 students in virtual school. Once upon a time, we had concerns about opening up classrooms to parent and caregivers. I have been encouraging teachers to begin to explore home visits. There are programs around home visits that's been happening in North America now for over 10 years, where the research has just been overwhelming in terms of the impact and the outcome of it. When teachers were doing home visits, we actually saw some of the things that we talk about and have concerns about in education, right? The significant reduction in attendant issues and social workers having to be doing these attendance work was significantly reduced when educators were doing home visit, not social workers, not child and youth workers, when teachers were doing home visits. Usually when I do this PD with teachers, there was a resistance to it. Isn't it amazing now the teachers are doing daily home visits, are they not? Secondary teachers who were resistant to the idea are now doing home visits. They may be virtual home visits, but you're doing home visits nevertheless. When we encourage having parents in your classrooms, opening up that space and not being hesitant to bring them in to share learning and to co-lead, there was some resistance to that. Isn't it amazing what the opportunity COVID has granted us? Because right now, Monday to Friday, there are parents and guardians who are co-leading kindergarten classrooms as we speak. So the things that we were resistant to or hesitant to do, COVID has provided us with the opportunity to explore that. Once upon a time when I used to hear, Michelle, I can't get an interpreter, I don't know how to find one. Can I say to you, COVID and putting us virtually has opened up the opportunity. And I wanna to say to every parent caregiver out there, any educator out there who's listening, 
There is no reason why we can't be engaging multilingual families. The technology has made it easier for us to do. Remote interpretation is our district offers it. Can I say that again? The Toronto District School Board again, the Toronto District Board offers remote interpretation, whether video or audio. So let us not sit in this place of comfort or that we cannot engage because we don't have language capacity, because that's not the case. Technology now makes it easier. You can have a, class, a teacher in a classroom right now with a family whose first language is not English with the interpreter sitting right there in the classroom. You can have a teacher in a classroom right now working with a sign language interpreter in that space. And it's far more cost effective now than it was in the past because it is video virtual. Associate Faulkner said earlier, why haven't we done it? And my response to that is because the moment and the time wasn't ready for it. But this is one of the moments and the opportunity that COVID has granted us. So I don't want us to sit in the place of doom and gloom with what COVID has done. Because while it has brought challenge, it has brought us opportunities, particularly in this area of engagement, and it has pushed us out of our comfort zone. And I dare say all of us are now sitting in a place of discomfort. What do we do when we sit in places of discomfort is entirely up to us. Because remember my first quote, we have the power to determine and decide, right? And so in this moment, let us determine and decide that we're going to disrupt and we're going to sit in our discomfort around all these things, right? And ride the wave of discomfort. Because if we ride this wave of discomfort around engagement, we will eventually get to that what I'm an Oprah lover. So I'm going to say that aha moment where we recognize that of which we've been afraid of that of which we have been afraid of, that of which we have been resistant to do, we are now doing. Not suggesting it's as easy, but we are now doing. There is no way I can leave this conversation without talking about school councils, particularly when I have their attention. So one of the disruption in school councils that I'm putting out there is that we ensure school council is a safe space for all that school council now pursue authentic engagement by providing space for all parents to be their authentic self. What do I mean by that? It means that I should be able, as a woman of African descent who claims that identity, come to school council and speak comfortably with that authentic self of being a woman of African descent and speak comfortably about the, the attributes that brings, but also the challenges that brings without people feeling threatened or discouraged by it. That's what I mean about providing a space for each parent caregiver to be them their authentic selves. But also ensuring that equity and inclusion is built into who council is and how they operate. And that we're intentionally disrupting the practices that support racism, classism, and other isms, whether intentional or unintentional. So how do we do this? Here are the couple of things that come to mind for me. Pay attention to our language and our narrative because I hear it all the time. So the language of this is how we've always done it. This language of this is how we've always done it becomes exclusionary language. It becomes this is mine, I want to protect and keep it. So the way to ensure that council is pursuing authentic engagement you're doing away with this narrative of this is how we've always done it. And you're opening yourself up to now saying, what do we need to do differently? And how do we do it differently? Because if that's the language that a new parent caregiver guardian hears at your first meeting, then you'll recognize that you don't have an engagement gap. But this is how we've always done it absolutely creates barriers for engagement. The other one is, I took the leadership role because no one wanted it. I hear this a lot around elections period. Or the other one is, I have done everything, but they are not coming. There's no such thing as we've done everything. 
And if we have done everything, we've done everything through one particular lens, and that is our lens and our identity. We've done everything where we stepped out of ourselves and our comfort zones, and we've asked for help to be able to say, you know what, I recognize that the way we even run our council meetings has been based on what I know. Is there another way of knowing that we need to be doing and hosting how we hold our meetings, right? I've taken on the leadership. Could the language be, you know, I've taken on the leadership. I will nurture a new leader. Is there a parent who's here who's willing to me nurturing you into that leadership role? Because that's the transition we need now. Because if we continuing, I keep that role because no one wanted it. Those who are in the space who actually wanted it are not likely to step up to take it because you've had a legacy there and they're not gonna come out and disrupt that. But if we disrupt that legacy and open up the possibility for another parent, caregiver and guardian to nurture leadership, then we'll begin to do so. And the other one for me, which I'm gonna tell you is a pet peeve if I move across councils, Michelle, we're just informal. We're informal because our newcomers and our parent caregiver don't like structure, really? Michelle, we don't host elections because you know, we're just an informal group. And because we lack engagement, really? Because that's usually what I'm thinking or I'm saying when I'm talking to councils, right? Because what happens with informal is the same group of people get to speak all the time. Despite what you believe, because many believe, Michelle, when we're informal, everybody gets welcomed. I want us to really think about that. In council, when we're informal, we're sustaining status quo. And we sustain the status quo because when you're informal, it's those who have always spoken who will speak. It's those who have always led who will continue to lead. And for many of us, we think the intention of informal is that it's gonna bring more in. I want us to think about that. Because when it's informal, those who enter our space usually have an understanding of what it should look like. So when we have no understanding of what should be, when the same voices speak, the parents and caregivers believe, well, that's how it should be. When the same chair remains the same chair for 10, 15 years, parents believe, well, that's how it should be because we're informal. When we do the same activities, parents believe, well, that's how it should have gone because we're informal, right? So let's pay attention to that and change the narrative that we're gonna put in place some practices to ensure that we're equitable. We're gonna make sure we promote these practices so all parent caregivers know that this is how our council is to be operating. And we're gonna communicate and share that broadly. And we're gonna challenge places where it's too informal because informal sustains the status quo. And we're gonna to use tools such as school council emails, Zoom accounts, school messenger. And I'm gonna pause because I know many of you are saying, yeah, Michelle, what are you talking about? School council email, what? Mine is not working. Zoom account, yeah, it was working, Michelle, but it's not. School messenger, well, Michelle, you've not rolled that out yet, but hold on, hold on. Gonna pause this, I'm very excited that we are coming with school messenger, just got the word, so it'll be coming soon. And I know that there are challenges with these tools, but can I just be excited for the moment that we have these tools in this district? Can I just begin there with that little success, just that little success that in this moment, in this COVID period, this district was able to roll out Zoom accounts for school councils. Can I celebrate that? I wanna celebrate that because I know many other districts don't have it. And while it's a small celebration, I wanna be sure that these tools, when they work, cause they will work, because there's too many of us working behind the scenes for it not to eventually work, right? That these tools are being used to bring people together, to bring care parent caregivers and guardians, and guardians together. That they're being used to facilitate conversations, that they're being used to nurture relationships, and that they're being used to provide spaces for racialized and multilingual parents and guardians together. School council, don't hesitate to offer your Zoom. If there's a group of Spanish parents who wanna to get together and talk, why not share the Zoom so they can do that in their mother tongue? Even right now, if your virtual parent care caregivers wanna connect school councils, why would you not be using this platform to say, let us support that? 
this is what we're doing in this moment as councils to lead engagement in this unprecedented moment and maximizing our opportunities to do so. I'm watching the time, so I'm quickly going to wrap up. So let us imagine future possibilities of engagement. Let us go and be open to the possibility that there is something greater waiting. And because I eat, sleep, and breathe parent caregiver, and I love this work, I am so open to the possibility and the opportunities that are being presented to us right now. And so imagine a future possibilities of engagement. And I'm going to end again with Ayanna Van Zant, um, my mentor. Let us believe that loving each other enough to speak our truths and respecting them enough to trust that they can handle it. What that means for me is let us know that as parent, caregiver, staff, and educators, that we're going to believe in others enough to know that when I speak my truth of my experience, that your fragility will not be harmed. That you will not feel that your power is being taken away, but you're open and I trust you enough to know that you're going to grant me the space to speak my truth. Also, that it is not what you hear it is where you listen from within yourself that gives meaning to the message. And that you'll not just only hear me, but that you'll go within to understand me. And also trust that you will not be stuck in what you know, understanding that the only thing you know is what you have already seen. And we're gonna move forward in this engagement possibility that you and I, every one of us on this conversation right now is experiencing something that we have never seen. So this gives me optimism because while we have engaging in something that we've never seen, somehow we've pivoted and we've adapted and we're adjusting. We're, we're adjusting. So I'm going to trust that every parent caregiver, every educator, right? That we're not going to be stuck in what we know and that we're going to be open, right? And that we're going to be open and remain open to the possibilities that looking at the past, must only be a means of understanding more clearly what and who they are so that they can more wisely build a future. So let us do that in this field of parent and community engagement. Let us use this COVID period to be able to not sitting here waiting to go back because we recognize that going back, it wasn't so great for everyone. While it was great for some, there were many who aren't having such a great time to go back to the way we were, but let's look to the possibilities of the future of what engagement holds for us. I'm excited, are you? So let's get started.